very, well, I'm not very technologically savvy. Good, thank you. Nice intro in the green. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ranger Jan. I'm Ranger Brad. And uh, we're excited to be uh, sharing with you uh, stories of our, uh, from our national park, the mall in D.C. Uh, show of hands, anybody been to Washington, D.C. to visit the National Mall before? Oh, a few of you. Very nice. Very nice. Great. Well, we've got a, a bit of a, a story for you, a little bit about how, um, how one of our most recognizable structures got started and what it means to us today and a, and a little history to tie it all into the Constitution. Um, we're, uh, we're excited to uh, talk with you. And if you have uh, questions, we'll, we'll save some time for that at the end, too. All right. Cool. Let's see if we hit this content. So here we go. Know who this guy is. All right, gang. Can you see everything? Can you see the program? Excellent. Now, can anyone uh, tell me who this particular character is? Go ahead, shout it out. Orange Vest. George Washington. Fantastic. Father of our country, George Washington. He, of course, is going to be the commander of the Continental Army during the American Revolution, which gains our national independence. He is going to be, of course, uh, with that moniker, Father of Our Country, uh, very much revered, not only in the days in which our nation is being formed, but carrying all through the centuries up to the modern day. And we have many ways, shapes, and forms in which George Washington, of course, is honored. Uh, but in our park, uh, the clear indicator is the Washington Monument. And what we, Jen and myself, want to do today is take you on a little walk through the end of the American Revolution, through the formative process of our Constitution of the government we know today, and his taking on the mantle of Chief Executive or President of our young republic, and how all of this ties together in one particular spot in our nation's capital. So with that being said, what I want to do is press on to our next image. Now, what do you think George Washington looks like he's doing here? Anybody have any uh, guesses? Not all at once. Oh, is he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is he signing or making a? Contract or something? Constitution. Constitution. Yeah, he's, he's dealing with a group of men here, handing over a piece of paper, and uh, he's still wearing the general's uniform that he wore during the American Revolution. And this is a key indicator of exactly where we want to be at this point. He is giving back power. At the end of the American Revolution, George Washington, who could have held all power that he could possibly wanted in this young country in his hands is going to give it all back to the people and their representatives. And when he resigns his commission, he is going to say goodbye to three different entities. He's going to say goodbye to the Army. He's going to get, say goodbye to his officers. And he's going to say goodbye to the government who gave him his commission. In order to effect this desirable purpose and remove the prejudices which may have taken possession of the minds of any of the good people of the states, it's earnestly recommended to all troops that with strong attachments to the Union they should carry with them into civil society the most conciliating dispositions, and that they should prove themselves no, not less virtuous and useful as citizens than they have been persevering and victorious as soldiers. What this clearly shows is George Washington, even in giving back his power, he is showing leadership. That example he wanted to show to his troops to go melt back into the heart of the people from which they came and become model citizens, as he intends to do the same, going into retirement himself. Now, speaking not only to the soldiers, but also to the officers, in New York City shortly after the British Army repairs to its ships to go back to points around the British Empire, George Washington is going to take leave of his officers. 
He entered the room in Franz's Tavern in New York City, and he is going to cause a hush to go about the room as all of the officers looked to him for inspiration. And as he filled a glass with wine, he turned to them and said, with a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. And he paused as the officers took a glass themselves. And he said, I cannot come to each of you, but I shall feel obliged if each of you shall come to me and take me by the hand. This, my friends, is the epitome of leadership. He is going to be absolutely taking men who have been seeing battle-hardened experiences from all over this country, fighting the toughest army in the world, bringing them to tears with but a few sentences out of his mouth. George Washington is clearly showing inspiration and in merely just saying goodbye. But not only the way he says goodbye, but the, remember this, it's the fact that he is saying goodbye. He, of course, is going to say goodbye to the United States government, as it were, at that time. And he will go into retirement at his riverfront plantation at Mount Vernon, just south of Alexandria, Virginia, where he intends to live out the remainder of his days. See a couple of views of Mount Vernon. With his family, he would go into the sunset and live out his life as an American citizen. However, duty will call. As the Articles of Confederation, which are going to tie loosely our nation together in our formative stages of our country, it is going to be found that in 1787, in February of this year, we are going to have the Confederation Congress meet not to make minor changes to their arrangement as states, but to make a major change, to create something known as a constitution, which would bind our country more closely together. And as you can clearly see, the image on the right side of your screen, as it should appear, there stands George Washington, called back to his country service yet again as president of this convention, which will tie the nation that he helped to make independent together even more closely as a nation. The Constitution is going to do many things. Ultimately, it will be ratified over the years 1787, 1788. And we will have another state that will come along much later, um, state of Rhode Island. Um, this is going to be a document which will cover all the branches of our government, but more chiefly what we're discussing today is the presidency. And Article 2 of the Constitution is going to clearly mark out what kind of person is going to be needed to guide our country through not only this stage, the beginning of our country, but through time itself. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. He shall hold his office during the term of four years. And as you can clearly see this next statement, there will be an oath of fealty to the Constitution and in and of itself the people of the United States. They will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States. After Section 1, going into Section 2, another great responsibility of the President, they shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. And of course, now we have air forces even that the uh, president will be commander in chief of. This is a very daunting task that not just anyone would have the metal to be able to withstand not only the pressure of guiding a nation domestically, but also to literally be able to give the order to direct armies and navies in battle. and the power to work with our legislative branch to create things such as treaties. And as you see down here, as the article continues, the responsibility of the president are very, very deep indeed. On to section three. Of course, there is going to be this, this situation where we are going to have to have the president come before 
not only the government, but through that government, tell the people of the United States what the State of the Union is. And you may very well be familiar with this address that is generally given. At the beginning of every year, the President tells the nation what is the State of our Union. And into Section 4, this clearly is an exclamation point. It shows what kind of person is needed to be a President of the United States. Does this sound like something that just anybody could handle or someone with a special cut, a special jib of their being? Someone who has a special something that can lead not only a room full of people, perhaps a town full of people, but a nation. This is a pretty intense statement, Section 4, isn't it? Who could possibly be that man? Who would be the one that Congress would look to? We have a unanimous decision in the spring of 1789. Who does the nation look to for leadership? The man who had given all of that power back. And by essence, giving that power back, Congress knew that they wanted to give power back to this man to guide our nation through these early years of our new Constitution. On April 30th, 1789, George Washington will speak to the crowd Federal Hall in New York City, speaking of just truly this responsibility and the deepness and magnitude of what he is accepting. As you can clearly see in this statement, on the one hand, I was summoned by my country, whose voice I can never hear but with veneration and love. On the other hand, the magnitude and difficulty of the trust to which the voice of my country called me being sufficient to awaken in the wisest and most experienced of her citizens a distrustful scrutiny into his qualifications could not but overwhelm with despondence one who, inheriting inferior endowments from nature and unpracticed in the duties of civil administration, ought to be peculiar, peculiarly conscious of his own deficiencies. In very flowery language, George Washington has just underscored what Jen and I wanted to get across to you. This is a call from his country, and George Washington understands that this is something that the country is going to be looking towards someone with respect, not only for them to guide the nation, but someone who they know will respect them. And so George Washington becomes our first chief executive or president of the United States. It is shortly thereafter that something is going to be very, very important that George Washington will have to undertake in addition to his role as president, in the summer of 1790, in his first term, it is going to be placed upon his shoulders to choose a district of territory not exceeding 10 miles square to be the seat of our government. And as you can see a little bit further down, it speaks of two bodies of water, the eastern branch, which is known as the Anacostia River, which is just south of what we know as Washington, D.C. today, and the Conica Jig, a creek about 70 miles northwest of the city that empties into the Potomac River. George Washington is going to choose a spot of land to become our nation's capital. As we know it, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., straddling the Potomac River just north of his adopted home of Alexandria, Virginia, straddling that river on the Maryland and Virginia sides, 10 miles square. For all intents and purposes, as we see at this map right here, the Andrew Ellicott map with the flashing star that you may see there, the blue star at the riverside, this is going to be a monument to George Washington, taking on the form of Washington City, District of Columbia. And that star that I wanted to place in this program for you is going to show you where Congress intended for a further monument to George Washington to be placed. This is actually going to predate George Washington even taking the oath of office of President of the United States. It will be offered forth in the year 1783, when he was still a general. Therefore, a military memorial. But over time, of course, his accomplishments as president are going to be embedded in any type of monument to George Washington. What you see before you is something not unlike that which was proposed in 1783 by Congress. Congress 
proposed a statue, an equestrian statue, George Washington, mounted on a horse wearing Roman-style dress and bearing a bludgeon or a truncheon in his hands. This particular proposal is not going to see the light of day. Due to lack of money after the American Revolution, after all, it's a huge undertaking which results in an awful lot of money needing to be spent to ultimately achieve independence. So it's decades later that we are going to have an equestrian statue of George Washington placed in our nation's capital. And here we see, just northwest of the White House in Washington Circle, what we have today as a rendering of that early image of George Washington and a possible monument to him. This could be clearly seen as something as perhaps too little too late. There were many attempts at honoring George Washington, for I said the statue took decades to make. Does anyone know what this image is of, where this particular structure uh, is? There's something really, really familiar to you above where this particular image has taken place. It's a Washington landmark. No, this, Ranger Jen's giving you a little hint there. Anybody? No? This is the U.S. Capitol. And this is underneath the United States Capitol. A tomb was created under this Capitol building that would, as Congress intended, hold the earthly remains of George and Martha Washington. And this is being prepared as George Washington's centennial is being approached. 1732 is when he is born in Westmoreland County, Virginia. But here in 1832, we are going to have a nation wanting to have a tomb ready to place the earthly remains of George Washington that could be that perpetuating monument to the man. However, it was not to be. Martha said no, right? Martha didn't want it. Yes, the family ultimately is going to stand against moving the remains of George Washington. And in the inset there, you'll see the tomb, which still remains at Mount Vernon to this day. So we have an empty tomb in the Capitol. We have a statue that arrives too late. What else could possibly be in the footing to honor George Washington? No pun intended, because there is a foot. <laughs> and as the image rises, we see George Washington wearing a toga, a sheet wrapped about his body, based upon the statue of Zeus, one of the seven wonders of the world. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Do we like this one? I see some downward I think thumbs. some definite down thumbs. Oh, yeah, right up front. Okay. There. Yeah. Well, Tell me what happened to this one, just as, as a side note. In the early 1840s, we are going to have a fellow by the name of Horatio Greenow commissioned by Congress to create this statue. Based upon the statue of Zeus, as I said, one of the seven wonders of the world, it shows George Washington in this Roman-style dress, and it was supposed to be placed inside the Capitol building to be a final monument to George Washington. However, people did not tend to like it. Um, it was actually said that people climbed upon the statue and stuck plantation cigars in its mouth. There was a joke that was made about this statue. Give me liberty, give me death, but please give me some clothes. <laughs> the statue did not capture the national imagination. And today, if you were to go visit the Smithsonian, um, one of our famous museums in town, you can find that statue there. At one point, it was outside, and it was felt that it was better to move it inside. So, <laughs> it's, it's a very large statue. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, but, you know, as, as Ranger Jen and I were alluding to, and some of you with the thumbs down cast, um, it just didn't do the trick. Um, something needed to be done to capture the national imagination. Yes, we have this city, which as I said, is the first monument to the man himself, but it's not going to be until the Washington National Monument Society is formed. Early 19th century, we're going to have a privately funded operation that is going to choose Robert Mills, a South Carolina architect, designed honor George Washington with a 600 foot obelisk. Now you see, in this image right here, his plan for what a monument to George Washington would look like. This would have a flatter, what is known pyramidian or top 
to the Washington Monument. And it would have something known as a colonnade, this columnar structure around it that would bear honor to the founding fathers around the central monument to George Washington. It doesn't necessarily look like what you know as the Washington Monument today, but it does bear similarities, doesn't it? By 1848, a cornerstone is going to be laid. July 4th, 1848, President Polk is going to witness the laying of this cornerstone, and a little-known congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln is also there to witness these proceedings. However, the question is, what happens next? What do you think happens after all of this pomp and circumstance, all of this celebration, the laying of a cornerstone, the foundation of this building that Robert Mills is going to design so meticulously, what could possibly go wrong? Let me frame it in this question, in this statement. It was a privately funded operation. Green shirt, did you have an idea? Um. That dude who privately funded it ran out of money. <laughs> Very good. Uh, the money did run out. Um, and it was not only one individual. Privately funded, yes, but it was privately funded across the board. It was uh, believed that if everyone in the country gave a dollar, just a dollar, this monument could be funded. It believed it would cost at least a million dollars to make. But unfortunately, the money's going to run out. Can you see the Washington Monument there? This is an image of 1860 Washington, D.C. You can see the Potomac River in the background. You see that unfinished thing there? That is where we are going to see the money run out. Just over 150 feet is going to be built of the Washington Monument wrought externally of white marble. Gleaming white marble, unfortunately, it is not going to come to pass to be completed by the 1850s. It will stand and it will basically stagnate for years as ultimately war clouds are going to build into what we well know is going to be a war of brother against brother, family against family, state against state. You can see Union soldiers standing on the grounds just outside the Washington Monument with the unfinished building in the background. It's almost as if this testament to George Washington is also a testament to where our nation is in the 1860s. Stopping in the 1850s, continuing to languish in the 1860s. The Civil War claims over 600,000 American lives. And as the 1860s roll on and the war ends and our nation is being brought back together in a time known as Reconstruction, we approach our nation's centennial. And with this, President Ulysses Grant is going to demand that this building be torn down or completed because it is a blot on George Washington's name. The author Mark Twain, a friend of President Grant's, is going to say it looked like a factory chimney with its top broken off. Is this something, do you think, that would instill national pride? No. General then President Grant is clearly going to see this as something that's needed to be completed as we approach our nation's 100th birthday. Congress is going to start getting the ball rolling as far as perhaps funding a completion of the Washington Monument. That's exactly what's going to happen. It's going to be in the 1880s, however, that the construction is going to continue in earnest and before the construction is going to continue upward, it will continue downward. As the foundation will be bolstered, you see in this blueprint right here, it will not be until the foundation is added to another good 12 feet. You see it comes out like a pyramid underneath the structure. And here is a image of that drawing, of course, flattered with this image of the uh, the blue stone or nice coupled with the concrete that would hold the monument standing still and tall, just as George Washington did as our leader in our formative stages of our country. The Army Corps of Engineers under Colonel Thomas Lincoln Casey is going to be in charge of the completion of this structure, and he will be able to use machines to cut the stone as opposed to the hand tools 
that are going to be used to cut the stone in the early stages of the building. And by 1884, we're going to have, standing on this rather interesting uh, type of scaffold built on top of the Washington Monument, the crowning of what we know as the Washington Monument. December 6, 1884, the aluminum tip is placed on top of the structure, nine inches high, 100 ounces of aluminum, with important names and dates in the building of the Washington Monument around all four corners of this particular aluminum tip. But facing to the east, two sole words. Laus Deo, Latin for praise be to God, and these words face to the east, and as they face to the east, the sun rises, but never sets upon those words. Very symbolic as they place this cat upon the Washington Monument. It will be formally dedicated the day before his birthday in 1885, February 21st. The reason for that being his birthday fell upon a Sunday, February 22nd, 1885. Now here, why am I showing you a picture of sun coming through the clouds? Because for all intents and purposes, that's what the Washington Monument is supposed to represent. Sun coming through clouds has, from time immemorial, uh, has been a sense of inspiration to cultures around the world. And as we can clearly see, there are ties. The Washington Monument, the obelisk which it takes, is clearly a representation of light coming from the heavens or inspiration, just as Washington was that to the young country. Now, I will also tell you this. George Washington was not a short guy. He was six foot two and a half inches tall. Anybody have any idea what the tallest structure within the city that bears his name is? Correct, the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument is the tallest building within the city that bears his name and will continue to be so. If you wanted to find George Washington in his day, really all you had to do, if he was in a crowded room, just look up, and that's where he was. How tall was he? How tall he was? How tall it is. Washington Monument's 555 feet, five and an eighth inches tall, and through this Heights of Buildings Act, it is going to clearly show, and this is just a portion of it, that no building in this city is allowed to reach anywhere near the height of the monument to Washington. Okay, Even to this day, this will remain the most distinguishable landmark on the skyline of Washington, D.C., 555 feet, 5 and 1 eighths inches, which brings me back to Robert Mills' plan. Does anyone remember when I first brought up Robert Mills? How tall did he intend a Washington Monument to be? In the back there. Couldn't hear you. Uh, plus six hundred. Did you say six hundred? Because that's the right answer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Robert Mills intended the Washington Monument to go to six hundred feet. And the Washington Monument, however, only makes it to 555 feet because, as I said, it's an obelisk. And an obelisk is only supposed to be 10 times high as it is wide. The Washington Monument is 55 feet, one and a half inches wide. So that's why they decided to change Robert Mill's original plan. You can also see that pyramidion, that thing at the top, the point of the Washington Monument, that's also 10% of the height of the building. Okay, so they made a couple of modifications to Robert Mill's Design. Now, you'll notice the flag perimeter is also a hearkening back to Robert Mill's original colonnade concept, but rather than honor the Founding Fathers, we have a flag for every one of our states. Okay, so it, it honors the people, as it were. Now, here is an example of another way that the Washington Monument is going to be completed over time. As I said, it was finished in 1884, but as it was being completed in the 19th century and all the way up to the 1980s, special stones are going to be embedded into the interior walls honoring George Washington that came from every state of the Union, all 50 of them as a matter of fact, from Delaware all the way to Hawaii, but sometimes foreign countries sent stones, uh, private individuals, towns, municipal organizations. I'd like to show you a couple, but this uh, particular ceremony right here is on one of the stairway landings of the Washington Monument. 
and you can see up in the corner there they're dedicating the North Dakota Stone, and this was added to the monument in the early 19th, uh, excuse me, the early 1900s. I just mentioned here that uh, you're seeing people in the stairwell, which is a, a real treat today because we don't let people go up and down the stairs anymore. Today, anybody visiting the Washington Monument goes by elevator. Um, and uh, there wasn't an elevator when it first opened. I don't know if you're going to get to that. Um, it was steam powered, so it took a much longer time than our 72nd ride today. But uh, this is kind of a cool peek inside the interior of the monument, which we don't often get to show people today. So we're taking you on a sneak peek behind the scenes. And as Jen said, uh, you used to be able to walk or take an elevator. It was powered by steam, took 12 to 15 minutes originally, and they turned it into an electric elevator in 1901. Uh, just a little over a minute the ride takes to the top now, but uh, the new elevator that we have currently actually pauses at a couple of sections on its descent only. And the windows in the elevator car become clear, and you can see some of these stones. So it's nothing that's completely hidden to the public these days. But as Jen said, unfortunately, uh, there are many circumstances that led to the stairway being closed off in uh, 1976 to general traffic by the public. But I wanted to show you a couple of these. I think you might get a kick out of one of them. Um, we see the North Dakota stone there. Well, check this one out. We didn't even know who we were talking to today. This is impressive. Now, what do you think the Arizona State Block is made of? Anybody? Copper. Maybe copper? Copper, copper, copper. Oh, Interesting. It's not, it's not copper. Something kind of special. They tried to get the state stones to be something special from the area that they came from. Right. So, like, oh, I don't know what else you have on the Petrified wood. Petrified wood. Petrified wood. Very good. The Arizona state block is made of petrified wood. Uh, we have another state here. Alaska. The last last state stone to be added to the Washington Monument in 1982. This is a block of something you'll find in jewelry stores. Jade. It's worth three million dollars. And as I mentioned to you, it's not only states, but the city of Bremen in northern Germany sent a stone. And to translate for you, it says Washington, of course, at the top, but right underneath that, it says to the great, good, and just George Washington. So even overseas, the, the legacy of George Washington is known. And it is so powerful that it beckons to sometimes have some of these nations embed a block in his very monument. This is something you would see when you enter the Washington Monument, his profile clearly, and you have 13 oak leaves representative of the original 13 states and five acorns embedded underneath his profile to represent the states that were created out of the extra land received from the British at the end of the American Revolution. This was known as the Old Northwest Territory. So we see even in the decorations around the Washington Monument, there's these symbols of the birth of a nation. Above him, you might see something that may be confusing, you may be familiar with. This is an Egyptian symbol that represents the Egyptian god Horus's victory over the evil god Set that was placed in Egyptian temples thousands of years ago. And why is this in the Washington Monument? Because it's an Egyptian style construct. And this is a temple of sorts because, as it was said at the dedication of his monument in 1885, it's dedicated to the immortal name and memory of George Washington. So a blend of the old, a blend with the new. And perhaps one of the most impressive facets of your visit to the Washington Monument or your glimpse of George Washington. This is the best rendering I could find of what is called the Houdan statue, a very detailed statue of George Washington in what he believed to be retirement after his military service but prior to his presidency. He is going to be visited by a French artist named Houdan who had him lay on his back. Visiting him at Mount Vernon, plaster was applied to his face, but not before Houdan stuck two straws in his nose so he could breathe, because after all, you want George Washington to survive the process. <laughs> When the plaster hardens, he had what is known as a life mask. And what you are looking at literally is the exact image of what George Washington's face looked like, but Houdan making 
uh, measurements of his body as well. It is going to be the most exacting rendering of George Washington in his life. Paintings are nice, but they're only two dimensions. If you ever get to stand next to the Houdan statue, it is clearly very impressive and shows what a physically imposing person George Washington was. This physical presence that he embodied in life, of course, as I already said, is embodied in his monument. And here, the Capitol building, one of President Lincoln's legacies. This dome completed at the end of the war between the states here in the foreground and of course in the background clearly seen is the monument to George Washington. This is a very identifiable city. You don't have to be standing inside Washington DC to understand where you are. Just to look on the horizon, the seat of our government and the monument to the father of our country are clearly the two most distinct features on the city skyline. The end. <laughs> So, I think we have plenty of time to uh, answer some questions, and hopefully we uh, gave you something to think about, and um, you all want to come on up one at a time and, and throw out some questions for us? Um, we heard yesterday that the, some people think that the Washington Monument symbolizes evil and the Illuminati. What is your opinion on that? I completely disagree. Uh, the Washington Monument, um, as it is in the form of an obelisk, uh, throughout the thousands of years that obelisks have existed uh, from the Middle East, as I mentioned, that tie to ancient Egypt, obelisks are images of inspiration and nothing less than that, especially when you tie it to such an august or important figure as George Washington. I would uh, say to whoever said that this was an instrument of evil, no such case. Uh, this is a clearly, from its building stage, a symbol of inspiration and it carries through the decades and centuries up to us as a symbol of inspiration. So I would, I would take umbrage with that. So yesterday I toured out uh, in the park with a group of students, a little bit younger than you guys, and uh, a few of them went up and touched the monument. You can get right up close to it, you can put your hands on it. And um, I heard a couple of the students say, after they had touched the monument, that they were never going to wash their hands again. Still so has that's a huge inspiration. effect. Anybody else? Um, you said that the stone from uh, Alaska was made of jade and it cost $3 million. That's more than the entire Washington Monument, right? <laughs> it's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Or uh, yeah, it may, maybe it may, may be a loaded question if you already know how the, the cost of the Washington Monument is. Very good, though. Um, yeah, the uh, three million dollar price tag placed on the jade was actually uh, placed on that stone that was donated in 1982. So who knows how much it's worth right now? But uh, yes, uh, the Washington Monument cost. Remember that estimate of $1 million? It cost $1.187 million to build. And that Alaska stone in and of itself, uh, yes, uh, 3 million, almost tripling that figure. Very good. Anything else? Uh, red coat. Um, so you just wanted to say that. <laughs> about, uh, about the, another thing about the uh, Alaska jade stone, is there any more expensive stones in the, in the Washington Monument? Are there any more expensive, or is that the most expensive one? As, as, far, uh, as far as money and value goes, I believe that's the peak. Um, there are lots of different uh, materials, uh, chiefly granite, um, your marbles, those are very much common uh, types of materials that were used to create some of these decorative blocks. Uh, but you do have, I heard someone mention that they thought maybe the Arizona stone was copper. Uh, we do the stone from Michigan, or I should say the block from Michigan is made of copper. Um, Think about it. Uh, Minnesota's is red pipe stone, the yeah. same material that the ceremonial peace uh, pipes 
and the Plains tribes were made from. Some of them are really big. Yeah. Like in the Baltimore, um, there's a from the city of Baltimore, Maryland. There's one, and it's it's 36, huge. It's 36 I mean, it's square feet. It's very six feet. detailed. Yeah. Sorry, Jen. No, no problem. It's uh, the Baltimore stones, uh, six feet tall by six feet across, 36 square feet. Uh, the ones that we showed you were maybe two by three, something in that range, maybe a little bit bigger. And if I could just go off on a tangent for just a second, um, one of the one of the the, the commemorative stones really um, reach into kind of our job as park rangers, which we didn't really talk about at all here. But um, the issue, one of the issues. Um, with the stairwell not being open anymore is the is the fact that over the years people were damaging some of those stones. When you could walk by and go right by as you're doing the stairs and see all of these beautiful fancy stones, what do you think you're gonna wanna do when you see something really cool in front of you? You're gonna reach out and touch it. And over the years, those stones were getting damaged. And so it became an issue for the Park Service to decide um, is it our, more important for people to have that chance to go up and down the steps or more important for us to protect the monument? And we felt that it was really necessary to take care of. That's what our, our mission is, to preserve and protect, but also allow people to enjoy. And so that elevator Brad described is a great compromise, um, but it's a uh, it's really important part of our job to make sure we're taking care of these resources so that when you all get your chance to come visit us in DC, you'll be able to uh, see the Arizona stone in all its glory and uh, and be able to uh, see it not falling apart and things like that. So take uh, kind of special pride in that, especially this year with our, uh, our 100th birthday of the Park Service. I don't know if you've heard other park rangers at all talk or not, but um, it's a big year for us in the Park Service celebrating our 100th birthday. So sorry, tangent. No. Anybody else have anything they want to share, ask? Looks like a comfy classroom you all have there. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, oh. There's a couch out of you. Have people tried wow. to? <laughs> have people tried to break in and steal like I don't know things from the, uh, any monuments? <laughs> and like. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, something that I think is pretty much the most dramatic theft of anything occurred back in uh, the 1930s when the Washington Monument, you know, you see it before you hear, uh, it had a scaffold completely around it. And every few generations there are restoration and, uh, you know, uh, efforts to, uh, to keep the monument uh, you know, standing tall, sometimes stone repair, whatnot. And uh, what happened was during this time when President Franklin Roosevelt was, was our, our president, um, we had someone climb the scaffolding that the workmen climbed every morning to, to work on the building. Uh, during the hours of darkness, someone climbed the scaffolding and they took the lightning rods that were on top of the Washington Monument. Now the lightning rods were placed around that aluminum tip that we talked about. And as we're talking about this, the 1930s were the time of the Great Depression, of course beginning 1929, but the decade of the 1930s is clearly known as the Depression and the uh, economic downturn in our country. And someone climbed the monument, not to just get something unique, but they got something unique and very valuable, and it's one of the biggest uh, stories of theft ever in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., when the, the platinum lightning rods were stolen off the top of the Washington Monument. I'll tell you one other thing. Um, yeah, the, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention to you was something uh, that as the Washington Monument was coming into its uh, last stages of buildings, as I told you, these special stones were added to the interior walls. There was a stone that um, is going to be stolen from the Washington Monument before it could even be placed inside of it. Now, uh, this is in the earliest stage of the building of the Washington Monument, remember before it became that factory chimney with the top broken off. Uh, an organization, a political party known as the American Party, or the, as they were given a nickname, Know Nothings, because they were very secretive about their dealings, um, they are going to be in control of the Washington National Monument Society at this time, but they're going to engineer something that they want to look like 
a heist or a theft done by an outside party. They took this stone that was sent to the Washington Monument to honor the father of our country and they destroyed it. They dumped it into the Potomac River and it's believed to be the remnants of what was once this stone is just perhaps, no pun intended, a stone's throw from the Washington Monument because the river used to flow right next to where the monument stands. Now why was this particular stone very special? The stone came from Pope Pius IX, Rome. And this, known as the Pope Stone, was a clear indication of where our country was at the time. The Know Nothing Party uh, was a very anti-Catholic organization, and as the Pope sent a stone to honor the father of our country, the Know Nothings didn't want to have anything to do with a stone from Rome inside the Washington Monument. So the, the stories of crime, um, not to romanticize them or anything, but our uh, stories from perhaps the most mundane uh, stories of, uh, of just abject thievery in the form of the platinum lightning rods, to s stories with real meat behind them that give you a sense of what the time was all about, like the theft of the Pope stone. And there are a number of stones, aren't there, that um, never made it. One of our coworkers has done some research into how many different stones were sent that never quite got installed. Right. So we have a collection now of 193, and who knows how many more we could have had. And some really interesting stuff that, um, you know, before the Civil War, some of the states from the South talking about how the Union should stay together forever. And when you, you, you know, you think about what happened and how that didn't quite come to pass, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So the monument has this whole, as we're looking at this picture of it from the outside, this whole kind of hidden history on the inside walls that a lot of people don't know about. So, cool. Yes. Anybody else? Anybody been inside the Washington Monument before? Awesome. See so, someone in the back? Yeah. It's a, it does require a ticket, so if you're ever planning to come to Washington, you want to, uh, you want to check it out or get the folks to check it out in advance. Um, you can you can reserve a ticket to go up. It doesn't cost very much. They just uh, they charge you just to reserve it. But um, it's a uh, it's a cool trip. Seventy seconds to the top. You get to look out for two windows on each side, and you get all views of the city. So.